she taught vocational education for 30 years in um, four Texas public school districts. She served on state and local committees for curriculum development, textbook adoption, at-risk youth, um, teen and parents, innovative courses, school-based decision-making, teacher selection and teacher training, and much, much more. <laughs> she taught courses for the Texas Education Agency that felt certified fellow teachers and in specialized vocational sc schools and via community colleges. Um, she sponsored student vocational clubs and contests with students. She's been an educator for many, many years, and she's now retired. And the topic she's going to be talking about is really important. So before we can talk about education reform, we must first understand how our system works. We must look at the role of each layer of government, the money involved, and the power that universities, unions, judges, lawyers, and lobbyists have in our schools. Then we can see exactly where our efforts are needed to produce the changes we want. If you'll all join me in welcoming Colleen, and I'll hand it over to her now. Thank you. I'm not, I'm not used to students, you know, they're not really, you, know, you have to wake them up. I think y'all look like you pretty much know what to do. But um, like she said, is I'm an old educator, been around for a long time. I actually am so old that I started before there even was a federal department of education. So I watched it ruin education. And um, I have to warn you that if you're politically correct, you're not going to be very happy in here because I am not politically correct. I no longer work for the state. I'm just a retired teacher. I'm not employed by anybody, so I can say what I want. You're welcome to quote me, and they can't do anything to me. So um, it doesn't bother me. I know we have so many people that go around, and they're so afraid to say what's really going on in schools, and I'm not afraid to say it anymore. So. Um, what I really want is for you to understand the overall concept because so many people get bogged down into, um, which is how I started into this, they, they think they're going to go to their school board meeting and that's going to change their school system. And then I'm come close. Um, the way I got started is I was yelling at the television all the time. My husband told me I needed to do something besides yell at the TV. So I made him go March Washington with me on 912. And then we came back and it's like, well, now what are we supposed to do? So we joined a local Tea Party group that has become King Street Patriots. And um, after a while, after we had you know, meetings and speakers and all that, somebody said, we want to form a group to reform education. So I'm like, OK, I'll go to that. So I go, and they're all talking about going to school boards. And I'm like, no, you guys, like you're really missing the boat here. You don't, I realized they didn't understand the system. So that they couldn't reform it until they understood it. So I did a presentation for them on how the system works, and that's when they asked me to come and, and do it. And I've gone to a couple other programs and shown different groups. And it really is an eye-opener for a lot of people that haven't been in the system. I even had two teachers, they were elementary teachers, that have been going to, to work for 20 years, but they never knew how the other system worked besides their school because they didn't teach a specialized program. I was fortunate I taught a very specialized program. There were only 20 or 30 of us in the state that taught it. So when they needed curriculum development, they had to call us. Um, we were it. And we had to select the textbooks and all that, so we got to see how the system worked. We had to train each other. We had to train the new teachers because nobody else was doing it. So um, I learned a lot from that, and that's what I want to share with you. What I did is I made an overall chart that I'm, I'm not real computer savvy, so it was I have a few little corrections here and there. But on the back, what I did is I put all the different sites that I got information from. And I'm just rounding out the numbers. I'm not, you know, you, don't quote me, you said it was 7 million and it was really 7.2 million. I'm not worried about that. I want you to get the old idea of where the money's going and how much we waste. Um, but before I get you too depressed, what I remind you of on the top of this is really the voters. Amen. We put all of these people into their positions by our voting. Now, I must say that some of the people I didn't vote for, but I also didn't go out and campaign. I wasn't politically active before. So we put these people in positions. We either elected these judges or we um, put somebody in possession that actually appointed those judges. So we have nobody to blame but ourselves, but we also have the power of the vote to put people in there to fix it all. None of this is, is, is you know, permanent. We can fix every bit of it. What I'm going to do is start with federal government because there's three branches of education. And notice the teachers and the students, people that we should care the most about are over here. But most of the other stuff is over here. 
And so um, these people really have more power in what goes on in the classroom than the teachers and students do. So that's the part that we need to fix first. Um, and I challenge you, everybody should be, have a pocket constitution now, um, you should carry it with you at all times, to find some place in the constitution that says the federal government is supposed to be involved in local education. Read it a bunch of times, can't find it, and they know, Congress knows they're not supposed to be there. So when they write laws, they add little things to make us addicted to what they want us to do. Um, Congress isn't stupid, and they started off being pretty good. They pretty much stayed out of schools. Um, back in the 40s, they realized that some people needed help with money. Some of the rural districts, especially ag and home ec, because they're expensive for schools. You gotta have ovens, you gotta have sewing machines, you gotta have places to put the animals, you gotta have um, travel for the ag teacher to go to the farms and all that kind of stuff to help with the farm animals. So that was expensive. So the federal government offered grants for rural school districts to have extra money for the supplies for those programs. Nobody complained about them, everybody liked them. Um, it wasn't even until Clinton, Clinton's administration was the one that first took all the funding away for home ec education. Um, they left the ag, but they got rid of the home ec. But it's been around for years and years and years and years. Um, we've gotten to where there's so many of them. I gave you websites you can go to, but you can go through and just go through all these different laws that get passed. There's earmarks in there for all these little things. Um, one that everybody still uses is Perkins. Perkins is the vocational grant money. And that um, started off very small, but the federal government is really into helping, but good thing about Perkins is Perkins doesn't have a lot of strings attached, but it is federal money. Um, then there's even gifted and talented money. There's a law, so I forgot the guy's name, it starts with a J, but um, they only get $7 million a year, they're pretty wussy. Um, there's a whole bunch of them, so you could go through and just start adding up, you know, $100,000 here, $2 million there, and once they get started, they don't stop. Um, but they, they just go through, and so there's all these little ways that they get the money in. Um, the federal judges, though, actually had the biggest impact. Federal judges came through, and everybody, you're around, you still remember in, in 54, which I'll shoot. Um, nobody probably would disagree that this was a really good ruling, was the Brown versus the Board of Education to desegregate schools. And um, because of that ruling, we couldn't have schools segregated by race anymore. Well, instead of letting the states figure out how they were going to desegregate their schools, Congress has to get involved, you know, because whenever something goes wrong, somebody thinks they need to make a law about it. So Congress went, it took them a long time, but um, they fought for quite a while, but in 64, they passed the Civil Rights Act of 64. And um, it was to desegregate and to force schools to do what they want. But Congress knew that there's no place in the Constitution that they had any authority to do this. So if you read that, it says, um, prohibits, prohibits discrimination of race, color, and national origin in programs and activities receiving federal financial assistance. That's how they control the states is with money. That's why you see Obama right now, they're trying to force states to take their money, and then once they have their money, then they say, okay, you gotta have these standards, and you gotta give these tests, and all that kind of stuff. If you don't take their money, you don't have to do what they say. So it's like a you know a rich grandfather trying to force you to control the family through money. So that's why if you look at all these different things, that's what it says through money, through and it's different. We can't, um, you know, we all know you can't discriminate. That's you know with race, but that doesn't mean that they have any right to tell you how to run your schools. So there's two things they can do: is they can stop your money, or they can stick the Department of Justice on you. That's all they can do. Um, but LBJ was smart. I didn't really like the guy, but he was smart. He knew that one of the best things he could do is he's got to get federal money, more and more federal money in those schools so that they can pass laws and control them, to control everybody in the state. So the big thing they did was the federal lunch program. Before that, it had been a small program where um, through the Ag Department they gave commodities. A lot of you are old enough like me where you'd go and you'd get cheese and butter. Our schools would, I used to see this big chunk of butter that the cafeteria ladies would get. Private schools, public schools, everybody got the commodities back then. Well, LBJ made it big and it was like 66 or so. Um, turned it into 
federal money for free and reduced lunch, you know, to help everybody, help those poor kids so they can have a hot meal. Well, what happened is once you get the schools, now we've got the federal money so that they have to do what you say. Now it's grown to a $10 billion a year program, and many of these people also qualify for, um, for food stamps. So they're getting their food stamp money, but then they get their free and reduced breakfast and lunch and now snacks after school. And there's actually been legislation in the state legislature, uh, state legislature trying to get dinners at school, but it hasn't passed, thank goodness. But the idea is the whole, that kids are going to be addicted, that you have to be, you know, school is sponsoring everything and supplying everything for everybody. Um, another one that they do, oh, I thought oh, it's really funny. This one is my favorite, though. Um, you know, they know that they can't justify this stuff. They're not supposed to be involved. So what they did is the new one, you know, we've all been saying, where in the Constitution are you supposed to be doing this? So they added this now in the new, um, the National School Lunch Act. <coughs> It is hereby declared to be the policy of Congress as a measure of national security to safeguard the health and well-being of the nation's children and by having this, the new free and reduced lunch when they, when they, um, you know, every once in a while they do go, what, what do you call it when they resubmit it for money? Anyway, whatever that's called in Congress, it's like, oh, national security, and that's just too funny. Um, but then they also, at the same time, in the 60s, LBJ started Head Start. It was supposed to be kind of like the Montessori program had been in Italy where we're going to help kids who don't get a lot of uh, help at home learn how to go to school like the other kids did that had been successful. Now, Head Start is a $7 billion program. We average over $7,000 a kid per child per year. And you would think the test scores would have skyrocketed because from 66, those kids have already gone through school, and then they've had their families who now went to Head Start and went on and on and on. Now Head Start is like this whole conglomeration. You look up Head Start in Texas, there's like this whole conglomeration of Head Start stuff. People are making a living off of Head Start, training Head Start people and all that. It's just a big scam. No test scores have improved. Basically what it is is free daycare. Um, let's see. Then what do we do? Oh, then... The best thing that um, came along, I think the only thing that Carter did where he was just so proud of himself um, while he wasn't hiding in the White House, was he started the U.S. Department of Education. Before that, education is left to the state. So he actually came up with a cabinet position, the Secretary of Education. Um, the largest part of that now is the Office of Civil Rights. <coughs> and what it is is um, the Office of Civil Rights has six laws that their lawyers are supposed to enforce around the United States. And um, it's the Civil Rights Act of 64, and a couple other ones, and I have that on there for you. Um, the 504 Rehabilitation Act, all these different things. And it sounds really good. And it says to prohibit discrimination in federally assisted education programs. So our tax dollars pay for 12 offices around the country with 650 lawyers and staff whose job is to sue states and local districts who don't comply with what they want you to do. So we pay the lawyers, and we pay the state lawyers and the local lawyers to fight each other with our tax dollars so that they can stay employed. And you're like, this is insane. I mean, they're totally insane. But it's all to keep us from, huh? Are you saying 650 plus staff in each office? Or no, totally. There's 12 offices around the United States. And um, a couple months ago, I looked at their website, and they had 24 openings in the Department of Education, and 11 of those were legal openings in the Office of Civil Rights. Um, that's their big, that's how they control everybody. And um, if they try, we'll not only take away anything, we take away your free and reduced lunch money, you gotta close your school cafeteria, you're, you're, you're in trouble. You wanna scare a principal in Texas, say, Oh my goodness, we're going to take away your free meal lunch money. Uh -huh. Do you know how much uh, how much they spend annually on, on the uh, Department of Education? I'm going to give you that in a second. Oh, okay. But that's, I gave you the website too. Right. They're very proud of it. I think it's hysterical. Um, the Department of Education budget last year was $64 billion. One of their, oh wait, we get the stimulus. One of my favorite things they do, um, 
they do initiatives, you know, where um, basically, because I, I was in teaching for so many years, I'm 15, I got to talk really fast. Okay, um, the president, you know, whoever gets elected every four years, they have another, they appoint another secretary of education. Whatever initiatives they think are important, then they have teacher resources online and stuff for, that, for um, those initiatives. And then the best one is through research and everything, they get like these really important people. And they use our money to send those people all around the United States to different school districts and use grants to offer free in services through Texas Education Agency or local school districts to spread whatever junk they want to spread. And um, basically, it supports a whole bunch of Harvard professors, Harvey, Columbia, um, Harvard, Columbia, University of Chicago, these people that are supposedly education specialists, and um, they write a book, and so it's like, who's ever friends with these people, writes a book, and then they use our tax money to send this guy all around the United States, and so they say to the, to the local school districts, we will give you a grant for $50,000. And it's so wonderful because, like, we will send this guy, this famous guy, Tony Wagner, we will send him to your school and your school district, and we'll provide lunch for everybody, and everybody will get his book for free and all the teaching materials for free because he has all the solutions to education problems. And isn't it great? And they send this guy to 50 states, so he makes a couple million dollars. And then, because um, the, our tax dollars bought his book for everybody, and then the teachers go and file that and some trash pile in the back. I found this one in the garage because it was just... Current one. Sure enough, he's a Harvard guy. But um, anyway, and then two years later, we get another little guy that comes through and does it all, and we all file his book because he didn't know what he's talking about either. But it's been going on a long time. It's a way for their, all their friends to make a whole bunch of money. And um, whatever the initiative is, like right now, it's safe and drug free schools. Well, it's safety for homosexuals at school. And that doesn't go over too well in most of our Texas schools, so people don't hire those people. What, what is that book? What's the. Uh... Oh, you want it? It's just a, I don't know. Just one of them I had to sit through the in service one time. <laughs> one of my favorite was the time. Uh huh? I'm sorry. I'm just curious. Have you done any research on how much this has grown since it was implemented by Carter to the $64 billion today? Mm -mm. No. Let me just say real quick. If uh -huh. we could say questions at the very end, because her presentation, um, we're, we're going to have time for questions at the very end. So if you just okay. write them down, and then we'll, okay. we'll do questions at the end so okay. she can get through the presentation. And um, in the stimulus package, they were good enough to give this lovely department an extra $97 billion. And then, you know, we have all those college grants and everything. And if you were wondering why were they trying to hurry a law through that said that um, all the college grants and all the college loans would be going through the Department of Education, remember federally assisted education programs? Well, there was a university um, back in 84 that sued and said, we don't have to do all that Title IX stuff. We don't have to have, you know, all these sports and everything for guys and girls equal and everything that, that the federal government wants because we don't take any federal money. But these lawyers went and said, no, you take financial aid. Well, it went all the way to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court says, no, the financial aid office takes the financial aid, and then they pay, you know, whatever, so you don't have to do that. So then they went and passed another law that said that any time you get financial aid or any kind of grants or whatever from the government, you have to follow all these laws. So they made a law, so now that the Supreme Court would say, well, this, it follows the law. So um, what they did now is when they, when they put all student aid, student loans, and student grants, we've added $173 billion. And now everybody, including private universities, if their students now are getting student aid and student loans, they're going to find a way to pay the department to where they're forced to do what they want. So it's all a control issue. Um, if you look at their budget for next year, um, if you look at what Obama has, what he says in his 2011 budget, he's um, asked for $225 billion for this department. And... Um, when you go and look at what originally they were supposed to do. Originally, this department was supposed to increase test scores through lovely research and everything. It was also supposed to get parents more involved. We know how few parents are involved in school. And if you look at the test scores, I put the sites in there so you can go look at these. Um, in 1972, the verbal was, the average verbal SAT score was 530. They opened the Department of Education at this time. So if you look now, 
1994, after we spent all this money, we're down to 499. Um, and then there was a big jump in 1996, because in 94 they decided to rework that test and change the way it was graded, right? Especially the math section. So um, if you can't beat the test, just go ahead and just change it a little bit, right? Um, it's just a great little trick in education that we do. But um, it's just really funny that if we spend all this money and it hasn't worked, what are we spending all this money for? So, you know, we still have some, few def some, some many deficit problems. But mathematically, if you took that money and we shut, the, we took all of this federal stuff and just shut it down, we would save $4 trillion in 10 years. Because they're not supposed to be in schools anyway. So we could just get rid of them and we'll just move on to the state. Um, if you actually read our state constitution, which I had never bothered to do before, um, Article 7 of the Texas Constitution actually says um, it should be the duty of the legislature of the state to establish and make suitable provision for the support and maintenance of an effective system for public free schools. It's in this constitution. This is who's supposed to be doing it. It's not in that constitution. They're supposed to be doing something else. Um, we also have the perpetual school fund. And um, that's overseen by the Board of Education. It's up to our legislature to decide how schools are run in Texas. That's our Constitution. And so if anybody says, no, they're supposed to be in the federal government, no, read our Constitution. It's in Section 7. Um, the way it works is the legislature actually makes the, te the Texas Education Code through laws. Not that I agree with all the laws they make, and they try to make a whole bunch every two years. Not all of them get through, thank goodness. Um, they're also responsible for school funding, but then we have the state judges come back in and that was a judge ruled that the way we were doing funding was illegal, so we had to make sure it was more equitable, so um, he made us change it. So it's who you elect for judges and who you have appointed as judges that can make a big difference. They can overrule half the stuff we want to do. So um, they're really responsible. If you're not happy about something, it's your legislature who did it all. They're the ones that are really in control. They're the ones that allow us to elect a state school board. That's how they have it set up now. And um, the state school board, basically, the legislature figures out, let's say, they say we need four years of math and four years of science. Now it's up to the State Board of Education to have hearings and all that of what is chemistry in Texas? What is going to be required in our chemistry classes to count as a year of chemistry? Then it's up to the Texas Education Agency, TEA for short, run by the Commissioner of Education, who's appointed by the governor, who we elect, to decide if a school is following that policy or not. They're like the police enforcers. They're the ones that say, no, that, you know, what you're doing over there, you're, um, that the teacher is not certified and all that kind of stuff, you're not complying. Um, they're the ones that are the enforcers and then they will say no that the school is not um, certified or whatever, whatever they want to do, whatever they're enforcing. So if you're not happy with something, it's a legislature. The State Board of Education, um, we've heard so much about them lately. Those poor people, um, they've really been through heck this year. But they're the ones that spend all the hours to make sure the details are right. And then these guys go and enforce it. Um, and these guys kind of can enforce it according to how liberal or conservative they are. They generally tend to be a little more liberal. They're also the ones that um, they're controlling Head Start money in the state of Texas. They're putting the regulations, do you qualify? If you ever want to make yourself really sick on how money is wasted, go read some of the Head Start regulations. You know, we want to make sure that you can identify like five letters before you get to kindergarten. Well, duh. What kind of, I mean, we're spending all this money and I think you did a little more than that before maybe after it's been there two or three years. That's kind of a little much. Um, another one that's been added in the last couple of years is the federal government gives the Texas the money to run the free and reduced lunch program and then we distribute it. When Susan Combs was Ag Commissioner, she added a whole bunch of rules and regulations to that. So if schools don't follow that, they don't get their free and reduced lunch money. So now the schools have extra burden. They have what the federal government says, and now what our ag commissioner has added. So that's, the, that's when we lost birthday cakes in schools and all that. If you were, you know, all of a sudden one day you couldn't bring a birthday cake anymore. It was all because of Susan Combs' ag commissioner. And um, we still haven't gotten our rights back on that one. But um, like if, if you have a bunch of high school boys 
and you could before we could bribe them with like a little those, little those really cheap ice pop things you know if you get everything on friday afternoon in the summer you if you get all your homework in you can earn an ice pop we can't do that anymore that's illegal or the school will lose their free and reduced lunch money so i mean it's, it's everybody attaches stuff to that free and reduced lunch money to make sure that they're controlling the schools to do what they want um let's see right now our budget it's about $33 billion, and um, it's a huge part of Texas money. Huge part is education because that is generally what the state spends most of its money on. Um, we have about $4 billion of that is spent on, they're, they're estimating on illegal aliens that we're educating, we're spending the money on, on that. Um, about $200 million is on bilingual education. If you um, pay attention much to bilingual, you know, it doesn't work. We started in 1973. Kids are still leaving high school not able to speak English. It doesn't work. Every year somebody in the legislature tries to pass, we're just going to spend more money on it. It doesn't work. Even California doesn't do it anymore. That's when you know it doesn't work. Um, <laughs> when they quit spending money on it, you know it's bad. But um, what they know does work is when a child comes in who doesn't speak the language, we teach them the language first. And then we start them in algebra and stuff with that language. Instead of having them go to algebra class when they don't understand what's going on and then having some teacher translate it into Spanish for them so they can get their algebra done, it doesn't, it doesn't work. It works much better if we spend six months teaching them the language and then letting them go catch up on algebra. It's a lot faster and easier. But um, we fight in the legislature about it, and they just keep funding it. Um, right now, we have about four and a half million students in Texas. And when you look at how it's broken down by race, and it's broken down by economics, and if they're special ed or not, that's because of all the rules these people and these people put on schools. Schools don't want to sit there and count kids by their race. And if it's a boy who's Hispanic and a girl that's black, we have to do so much paperwork on splitting everybody up and if they have a baby and if they don't have a baby and how many babies they have and I mean it's insane it is totally insane that I mean it's it's crazy but it's all this time and money you spend because these people tell you that's important and it keeps the teachers and administrators from actually getting to teach anybody anything um, we're ever in I did the years 07 08 just because then there wouldn't be any stimulus money in it um, the state of Texas says we, we averaged $7,000 a kid, but that doesn't include all the local extra money that people put in. Is that um, annually? Huh? Annually? Yes, annually. Uh -huh. um, we had um, almost a half a million kids in bilingual education, and at, they said, what's well, only $4, $450 each? Well, it adds up to you know, $200 million. That's $200 million of our tax dollars in a program that we know doesn't work. I actually had students who were born in this country who when I had them as a senior in high school were still going to bilingual, they still didn't speak English. Because why bother? You just go to this class over here and somebody translates it for you. So um, we just pay those people. Makes a lot of sense. Oh, that's not it um, and also, only one half of all this money actually goes into educating the kids, the actual curriculum and the actual teacher, student, something that the kid actually learns that they might see someday on the test. Because of silly things like this. This was a law passed in 2007 by our lovely legislature. Requires districts to adopt and implement a dating violence policy that is to include a definition of dating violence, including intentional use of physical, sexual, verbal, or emotional abuse to harm threaten, intimidate, or control another person in a dating relationship. And it goes through all these requirements that it has to have. So that meant that when school opened this year, that next year, schools had to have a dating um, curriculum. And they got to figure out, OK, where is it going to be? What class is it going to be in? How is everybody going to get this? Is it going to be through counselors? Somebody has to take their time and their money that they were supposed to be doing something else, and now you've got to have a dating violence person in your school that you've got to pay. So it's really stupid. They keep passing laws to make schools become some kind of 
social service. It's just insane, and that takes away from teaching. Now, when is the teacher supposed to teach this? You know, or, or, or back again. Okay. Um, another thing they do is we have tax, which is the essential non skills, which is the the um, state board of education has identified exactly what everybody needs to learn, and then we have the testing, exactly what everybody <coughs> needs, what they're going to be tested on. But then there's a school rating system on this stuff. So these guys are going to be judged on how well the kids do on that test, and it's big money for them. That's their job. So do you think they're really going to be worried too much about anything except this stuff? So they take the money we give them, and they spend it on making sure that kids are doing well on this, and whatever else happens is kind of okay. Um, you're certainly not going to discipline somebody and send them home if what matters really is that he needs to pass that test because there's a point system and it's a percentage and it's all of these subgroups and everything that we have. You have the, all the different socioeconomic subgroups. So if you have a hundred Hispanic boys, you can only have four of them fail one section of that test or you've gone over four percent. So you already know these four, they failed everything, give it up. But here's these other two, that they're on the borderline. So we're going to take all our time and money and we're going to put it into those two boys. The other 96, whatever, 95, well, 94, um, they're, they're okay. You know, we're not going to spend a lot of time getting them above grade level. We're going to spend our money on these two because then we will keep it at 4% and we will be a recognized school. So we, the teacher, they have all these meetings where they sit and look at charts on which kids are going to keep us at 4%. Because that's the system, and it's all invented by these people. And that's because, do you think this guy is a teacher? No, he's a lawyer. All of these people are lawyers. And I have a brother and a nephew that are lawyers, and that's how they think. We see a chart, and we can judge it that way. They can't think any other way. So they make all this stuff that makes sense on paper, but it doesn't work when you got got 100 kids sitting here. Um, anyway. I told you I wouldn't be politically correct. Um, also, when you talk about the budget, we have 290,000 teachers in the state of Texas. Remember, we had almost a half a million kids. The average teacher salary is 50140 The highest teacher paid in Texas makes $105,000. I wish I knew where that person was. It certainly wasn't me. Um, but highest superintendents in Dallas, that guy, so he can play golf and go to lunch. He makes $328,000 a year. And I love the laws they pass. It's so funny. We have all this money. You would think that the teacher could have some money to spend in her classroom on what she needed for her kids. Well, no, that doesn't work that way. So they passed a law, Bill 1844, that um, makes sure that teachers could get paid back by the school district for money that they personally spent in the class. And that, if each teacher spends $25, that means the Center Falls taxpayers an extra $7.4 million a year for the teacher to have some supplies for her room. Well, we're already sending $33 billion. Couldn't we maybe make sure that the teacher has some say in some of the supplies when they're purchased <laughs> instead of some of the administration billing? It would save us 7.4 million extra tax dollars. But no, the system doesn't work that way. So instead they pass another law so that the teachers can have $25 to buy whatever they need for their room. So it's a brilliant system. That's a brilliant system. Okay. Then what will really make you sick, if you live in Harris County, you're going to be really upset about this one. Back in 1876, whatever, whatever year they first started school systems in Texas, they had the Constitution. Constitution says the legislature has to do this. But they weren't that organized at first, so they said, okay, we'll do it by counties. And then, okay, once you have 500 students and your own tax base, you can start an independent school district and do what you want. But until then, we'll go to school in counties. Well, everybody's gone to an independent school district. All the smart counties closed their Department of Education in their county because they didn't need it anymore. They had independent school districts. Oh, but not Harris County. Um, see. They have figured out a way, and they even say it on their website. In the 60s, when the federal government started all of these programs, there's a whole bunch of federal money out there. 
So they figured out how to use that money. So the Department of Education now has a budget of $100 million in Harris County. They're not a school district. They're the Department, Harris County Department of Education. They service 300 students. And they have a faculty, I mean, they have a 1,500 um, employees. Oh, but they have support services for people. Even people on their own board. We elect that board. I never knew we elected that board. Um, but we did. I talked to one of them, and he's been trying to shut them down because it's a total waste of money. If we just shut them down, we'd save a billion dollars in 10 years. But they have really good lobbyists, and they go to the legislature and say, we're so important, look at all the wonderful work we do. Because they spread, where's that book? They like have people like this come, you know? And they, where they can teach all the teachers all this important stuff that comes from Harvard and everything. Look how much it has helped our test course. Anyway, um, but that's just one of those little systems. Um, what I do is I'm using, I, I live in SciFair ISD, so I'm using SciFair as my example. I left you on, on your resource list where you can go in and find out the exact salaries and it gives you the names of everybody that's employed by the state of Texas, including the school districts, and find out how much they're paid in your area, and your district. But when you get to local school districts, our local judges, of course, can overrule anything. We elect our local school board which I hope none of your school board members, I don't want to insult anybody, but that's pretty much a joke in most places. <coughs> People are really nice. It is so nice of them to volunteer, but most of them are not educators. They're not willing to stand up and say, this is a bunch of hogwash. So they go to these meetings where they have school board associations, and so they go and they train them and they teach them how to be school board members, which is basically learning how to just do whatever the superintendent wants. And so um, they all go and they learn how to run a meeting professionally and how to sit there and go yes and how to vote properly and all that kind of stuff, for the rules of order. But nobody ever stands up and goes, hey, we're throwing money away here. Um, I did work in one place where we would actually call, the school members would actually give us their home phone numbers and we could call them and say, we're throwing money away over here um, and stuff like that. And they actually, it was, it was a great working system. Um, we don't have that same superintendent anymore, so. That was gone, but it actually, I actually saw it work once and it actually did work. Um, then they hire a superintendent. And if you ever look at the news, you know, superintendent stays around a couple of years and then they buy out his contract because they get mad at him. And so superintendents, it's a great job if you can do it because you go to lunch, you go to meetings and all that, and then like you get your contract bought out in a couple of years and then somebody else pays you more money to come and screw up that place. Um, <laughs> anyway, and they, I only went one place where the superintendent ever visited a classroom. Um, unless there's like a photographer there, you know, they're kind of like Nancy Pelosi or somebody there. Um, they, they show up for those things. Um, in Cypher, the superintendent makes a salary of $268,000 plus all of his benefits. Um, but they work so hard, he has to have seven associate superintendents at $150,000 a year, which is over a million dollars of our tax money. Um, then we have to have assistant superintendents, which are right under the associate superintendents, we need 12 of them, and they make uh, average $115,000 a year, so we're over a million already again, and um, they have really pretty buildings too, their offices are really pretty inside, and then we have 37 senior directors at an average of $100,000 each, and um, that's the, uh, what, $4 million, um, then of course we have to have our lawyer, so I guess that's pretty low if you're a school lawyer, you only make $165,000 a year plus benefits. And then, um, I, out of the 30 top paid people in the district, seven of them were principals, and the highest one was $122,000. I'm going to be a principal there. Um, anyway, you, you see why a lot of times what happens, and Ailey read, read up that on Sac School District, it's one of the worst. They pay people higher salaries to get them to stay. And one of the things, if you look at the way the teacher and the, the retirement system works, is your top three years of salary are averaged together to get what your benefits will be when you retire after you have your 30 some odd years of service. So you go to some place who pays more the last three years and you stay three years and then you retire at a higher salary. So you don't really care what happens in the school district, you're only going to be there three years. Um, you don't know those kids. You didn't teach all, you know, their family and all that kind of stuff. It's a different, it, it's just the way the system works. So you get a lot of principals in some of these higher paid places 
that are there for their top three years. And then they're ready, they come, they're, you know, when they're near retirement. A really interesting idea. Um, but my favorite of all, which is the most corrupt system in the, started for the federal government, of course, is special ed. Um, in the special ed office in our district, there are 59 people who have phone numbers and emails in the administration office. Only, no, they didn't get all of their salaries because it's a variety. But to get an idea of how many you need, for, remember 11% of our kids um, actually graduate under special ed. And if you had, we had one out of my seven stepchildren that we got her through. She can't read, can't do anything, but we, we got her an actual diploma, which is the same as all the other kids' diplomas, but she can't do anything. We got it through on special ed. And now even she admits, I don't know anything. Um, but she has it on paper. It looks good. Um, but their departments are bilingual, ESL, dyslexia, GT, which is gifted and talented, 504, which is one of those laws that the, um, the federal government enforces with all of their lawyers, uh, Title I, which is another one of those laws, um, people first language, I don't even know what that is, adaptive physical, adaptive behavior, assistive technology, audiology service, occupational therapy, physical therapy, speech pathology, music therapy, special ed counseling, homebound for the kids who can't come to school, our teacher goes to them, transition, which is helping them go from um, school to work or vice versa, um, life skills coordinator in the elementary and in secondary, preschool program for handicapped kids, um, and then you have to have somebody run your newsletter and a secretary for all of those offices. And then the regular offices that are here are finance, food service, counseling, health services, um, partners in education, safe and drug-free schools, staff development, transportation, libraries, insurance, risk management, maintenance, custodial, purchasing, career and technology, theater arts, athletics, and the laptop program. We haven't even left this area. <laughs> So you wonder why there's no money down here? They spend it all by the time they get there. And they have to have buildings for all those people. They have to have custodians and everything for all those people. And they have to have lunch rooms for them. They have all this stuff for them. And there's no money left when they get down here. They don't want well, anybody, anybody to come down here. It's good school districts do. I've been in some that really do, but they're few and far between. Um, then when, by the time you get to the principals, then the principal really nowadays is in charge of hiring those assistant principals who are basically security officers. Um, in most of the schools, they handle all the discipline. And a lot of times those people have the, you couldn't pay me enough to do their job. And then you have the department heads, and last but not least, you have the teachers and the students. After all of that, we finally get down to this. And some districts do let the teachers through the department heads have a little say in what goes on. But a lot of them have gotten so, so full of bureaucracy that um, it, it's insane. Um, it's insane. Then you gotta have substitutes too for all these people. Um, one thing that people always ask about in Texas, we are not a union state. We're a right to work state. We do not have teacher unions. Like you see how corrupt they are in other states. But what we do have, we have all those lawyers TEA has its whole set of lawyers. And if you don't do what they want, they sick the lawyers on you. So teachers have to have, and the administrators all carry insurance for when you get sued. I can't tell you how many times I got threatened with a lawsuit. My favorite was the girl that enrolled with her attorney. I, you couldn't laugh because you got, you, know, you got a legal person right there. You're like, who is this person? Like, can you do this? Can you have a visitor's badge? It says attorney on it. Um, but she had been exp well, not expelled. She got kicked out because she had exposed herself to a principal. Um, so they, she got sent to uh, boot camp. She hit the boot camp instructor in the head. So they sent her to Texas Youth Commission. When she got out of there with her time, why would you come back to the same school? Mm -hmm. I don't know where the logic is there. But she did, and Daddy was afraid she wouldn't be treated right. So he hired a lawyer to spend the day with her at school. Um, by the end of the year, the judge ruled that, finally got a judge that ruled that she could not come back to another school in Texas. But we had to go through, she came in in like January, and we had to deal with the legal issues all year. And I talked to the lawyer more than I ever talked to the dad. But, um, I mean, it was, and the lawyer apologized. She said, off the record, I apologize, but, you know, I'm getting paid for this. <laughs> and it's like, oh, my Lord. Um, but they, we join organizations to get the insurance. They offer the, the insurance. And that's why teachers in Texas join these is because that's where we get the insurance. And so for a few hundred dollars, 
you're covered and they will send legal representation to you. Like, um, especially the big problem is all the emotionally disturbed kids in special ed. And they come, okay, I'll talk, I'll talk one more minute. What they do is they know the system. And so what they do is they come and say, if you don't do what I say, I'm going to say you touched me. And it's like, and finally, I got said, I went to this one principal and I said, and I put it in writing, I want somebody with, if he's going to stay after school, if you say that I must tutor this child, I need a, an administrator who's always in that room because this is what the child said, and documents only my word against his, and, you know, I was near retirement, so I was able to leave. But it was like, I mean, they threaten you all the time with stuff like that because they know the system. Mm -hmm. But we only, the whole district only takes 6% of its money from the federal government. Yet, 9% of the stupid controls are from the government. All this junk, most of it comes from the federal government, and um, it doesn't do anything but spend a whole bunch of our money. So my idea to fix it is first you just take the whole federal department and you just throw it away. Because we don't need it anyway. Just get rid of it. Then we get to what we really need. We just need to elect. But to do that, we have got to elect real leaders. We have got to elect, I'm not saying people are or aren't, but right now we have people that have a tendency to wait to see what's going to happen before they speak out. We don't need to keep doing things the same way. We need people that stand up and actually Get a list, get a group of teachers together to find out what they need. And the problem is our legislators are just like Congress. Just like Congress passed that health care junk. It's not even I mean, before, I don't know what that was. But they weren't, there weren't doctors in what they were doing. It was all for some political reason. Our legislators do the exact same thing with education. It's, they don't know anything about education, but they pass laws about it to please people and to get money from constituents or whatever they do. But... Um, most of it doesn't make any sense. Um, we also need to use our free market system. For some reason, they're so afraid of it. We could have food service. We could have professional food people. There's all these food corporations out there. Come in and figure out how do we run school food service. It's the only place in the world people make bread from scratch every day. I taught those ladies. They're really sweet ladies, but, you know, y'all, that's really inefficient. Nobody does that anymore. But school does because that's the way we've always done it. We make our bread in the morning. And yes, they make really good rolls, but that's ridiculous, you know? Well, <coughs> we just, we've got to get a little more modern here. Um, career and technology, we need the businesses, business and industry to come up with the training programs and then they can get implemented in the schools with the kids. They know what they need. Why should teachers be right? We don't know what the industry needs. It's really stupid. Um, free markets will take care of everything for us if we would just let them. We also need to stop, and that's over here, we need to stop the fun, fair, positive school idea. I'm sorry if your kids ever played fun, fair, positive soccer, um, because you come out there, you don't know anything about soccer. Soccer is not about putting on a uniform and everybody plays and kicks the ball around in a different position. We all get a trophy and wasn't that fun. No, look at the World Cup. That is not how soccer works. <laughs> you go and you, it's competitive, and whoever's really good stays on the team, and everybody else goes and tries basketball. There and if you, you don't go. do basketball, then you try knitting or whatever you're going to try, but you go until you find out what you're good at. Special education has become fun, fear, positive school. We take these poor kids that have autism and stuff, and we put, you know, regular clothes on them, and they watch regular classes, and they learn how to sit down and be quiet. But they, when they leave school, they don't know anything. They don't know how to get a job. They know how to go to class and how to read the you know, time, read the, the clock and all that. We've taught them how to change classes. We just pay fun, fair, positive school. I have kids, I have kids that were mentally retarded who thought they were going to be lawyers. But nobody wanted to hurt their feelings, so I'm sorry. We need to tell them that you know you're not going to go to college and be a lawyer, but what can we do? Just like talking about the butterfly. The, I mean, the boy found something he could do. We used to train kids in what they could do. It was called vocational education for the handicapped. Before they opened that stupid federal department of education, we were good at it. And then they told us we can't do that. That's discriminatory. So instead, we just leave with no skills. That's what really makes sense. <laughs> um, and we also need to turn this whole thing around. Last but not least. And oops. Yeah, get rid of the county thing. And put the, the students up on top. I know they're upside down. So when the kids are up on top, then it gets fixed. That's right. That's all I have to say about that. Do I have any questions? I know I've talked really long. Um, yes, ma'am. Oh, um, 
I just started working at a, a daycare, and I think it's uh -huh. private, but it's kind of it's, it's under um, Texas Rising Star. Is mm -hmm. that a state? I saw that when I was reading about Head Start, and I haven't. Um, there are so many so they get five, they get programs. Some, I, don't I don't know. I'd have to go. If, if you, I'll read up on it if you want to give me your email, and then I'll sure. email you. Because one, I saw, one thing they have in the, I mean, I. Uh -huh. I they probably get free and reduced lunch money and stuff like that. Well, they, I think they get money for equipment. Or <coughs> yes. Uh -huh. One of the thing, one of the other uh, providers said uh, that the, everything has to be labeled, and everything say doorknob, door, table. Mm -hmm. Even in the nursery. That's and because the, those, are the, those are federal well, regulations, yeah. English it's stupid. Spanish, but yeah. six-month six babies? Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's really so that you sit there and go, this makes sense to you yeah. people? But it doesn't matter because the person who comes in to regulate you to see if you get your money, they have a chart. And they have to check off the things on that chart. And if all the little check marks aren't made, you don't get your money. So, so you put the labels on there, even though it makes no sense. The labels for babies and toddlers and uh -huh. zeros. Yeah. Uh -huh. It's really stupid. And the reason is we use stimulus money. Stimulus money was given to buy supplies, equipment and supplies for food and stuff like that. For food, Not the actual food products, but the actual equipment. And so if you took that money, what you did was open your door to federal regulations. Uh-huh. In 2001, I had a... Uh, Rip Van Winkle experience when I returned to public school as a substitute teacher. Oh, that's crazy. After 44 years. I won't even do that. And uh, it was a very enlightening mm -hmm. experience. So my question for you is, what do we do about regaining control, control? of the students? Well, that's because where... Uh -huh. The students I encountered mm -hmm. in every class, it's horrible. a significant proportion of every class we're determined to make sure that no one else in the class learned anything. Mm -hmm. That's the, the trash has taken control. It's just like the border. I mean, you have the good people have moved away because the trash is there. Just like in Arizona, they just say, well, don't go over here. All the, you know, there's all this violence. So just don't use that 80 miles. Well, that's insane. We have, it doesn't make sense. We uh -huh. have hundreds of students showing up voluntarily for the Dare to Dream program in Waco, Texas. We we just won the Golden Apple Award for Partners cool. in Education. With you have a good ISD. principal and good superintendent. We don't we don't uh, we don't take no money from the. We're completely privately funded. We're, we meet before school starts, so uh -huh. these students are showing up before school to be a part mm. of the program. Mm -hmm. Basically, we. We find out what those students' dreams are, never mm -hmm. mind whatever they're learning in school. Mm -hmm. Hey, make good grades, do your best in school, but at the Dare to Dream program, we want to know what your dream is, and we help you to make real That's detailed exactly plans what they need. to accomplish their mm -hmm. dreams. We give them real, we help them make real plans, and then we connect them to local individuals, <coughs> individuals, uh, organizations, or business owners that have already accomplished See, and we it. used to do that in Texas yeah. through our vocational programs. So and once the federal government got involved, we couldn't do it anymore. That is a that is a very effective way mm -hmm. of gaining control of the students. Yes, because they, they don't know what to do. They don't they don't have any dreams at all. They don't, they no don't know what to do. They don't have any leadership. They don't I, have it at I home. Have, that's for sure. I have a few questions uh -huh. about on the on the federal thing, uh -huh. the, the trash thing over there. Uh -huh. It's uh, the hundred and seventy three billion. Is that that's, that's the stimulus this year? That was for that was for. Um, Grants and student loans and all that kind of stuff. Okay, and then what is the date law over here? What is that law called? Do you know the name of it? It's, a, it's, a, oh, you have, um, it's, it's I put it, I have it on your, no, I'm sorry, I don't have it. That one's Hats Bill 1, 121. And then. And you, I gave you the website, so where you go to right, the legislature. And, then and you can put date, violence, or whatever, and it'll give you the law. And then this system here you have, uh, it's upside down uh -huh. now. But the 7, the 12, you don't have to turn it over. Okay. This, the 7, the 12, the 37, um, these individuals. This was my, this is Cy Fair Independent School District. That's can, not congruent with, I mean, every, that's not the same. I gave you the website where you go right. in and put in your, your school district, and you can look at what everybody's paid in your school district. Okay. I just chose mine. Cy Fair is a large <laughs> district. And that is a, which, it just visits. It's one of the last ones. One um, of the last ones. Yeah. Texas Prince Burnton. Probably. Um. I think I wrote it on there. Uh, there it is. Government employee salary. Okay, cool. Uh -huh. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Uh -huh. I can't see them right now, but the pink numbers in the middle, can you go back over uh -huh. Can you explain what those are again? This was, um, 
this is the average, this is the number of teachers in Texas. And that's on the Texas Education website. It'll have this for you. And the 300,000 is what? That's the, that's the Dallas, um, that was the Dallas superintendent. It was listed as the highest. It gives you all the different, what the people make around the state. And that was Dallas the Independent School District superintendent. Um, this is the average teacher salary in Texas right now. Um, and that's the highest paid teacher in Texas. I didn't put the name, so I didn't look at the name where they're from. Um, I also wanted to just throw this uh -huh. out. Um, up until three years ago, my, my husband had a trucking accident three uh -huh. years ago, and I, I quit homeschooling and went back to work and had to put my kids in public school. So the last three years have been real eye-opening for me. Mm -hmm. I spent 15 years uh, home educating five children. And I just shocking for was them. looking at the 7000 a year that uh -huh. they spend on per, per student. I educated five students over 15 years, and the whole 15 years I only spent $4,200. But see, but you're not paying salary, and that's fair. Yeah. I, I lost yeah. salary by not uh -huh. working all those years. Mm -hmm. And that's an I'm just saying for the curriculum itself, yes. I paid $4,200 over a 15-year period. Oh, I know. And that's what, see, when we get down to the, this part, we're not spending a ton of money on curriculum and stuff. Um, it's It's... So much of it is all this stuff. And every time there's a new program, you have to have a director of that program, and then that person needs a secretary, and you got to have an office for that person. So they say, well, it's only it's not going to cost anything. Yes, it is. I mean, we're not that stupid. Um, and, but it's really remarkable the way they twist the numbers when you look at, you know, they say that how much money we're actually spending per dollar and all that. It's really interesting the way they twist the Did you stuff. mention uh -huh. how much this Sorry. costs annually? The, the day If you look on there, this, the... On that website, you go through actually where the bill was, and then yeah. they have a budget mm -hmm. office that actually okay. says they. I don't think they funded it. I think they just expect you to do it. Oh, uh huh. Okay. Yes, sir. Yeah, uh, the state seems to have two parallel chains of authority. Uh huh. Uh, the state board and the TEA. Mm -hmm. Is that a problem today? With each other. No, the TEA can't make decisions. The TEA does. These people set up the details and the guidelines. TEA is the enforcer. TEA talks to the schools and says, like, they put on their website, this is the curriculum that these people have produced, so this is what you must teach. These people are just volunteers. They don't have time to go and make a website about all that stuff and everything. So these are like the little worker ants doing what these people have said needs to be done. Do they do it? Mm hmm they, I mean, I don't always agree with everything they do, and I don't, I, like, one example is I had an autistic student that wanted to take driver's ed, and I was in the ARD meeting, and it was so that she could work, her mother really believed that she could drive to school, I mean, and drive to job and be in my co-op program, and I voted no. I said I didn't think that, I, that that's kind of getting out of the ballpark here, that's a little too unrealistic, and I did not think that this child Fit dusting does not qualify in my program. I mean, I, you know, mom went to TEA, got TEA lawyers. They found one line in the curriculum that would fit her, one half of a line. So they came back to the school district and said, you have to do this. You must be in driver's ed and she must be in this co-op program. Well, within two weeks, she hit the employer. So anyway, she ended up being fired. So technically, once she got fired, then I get her out of there. She was a wonderful child and I really liked her. But this is not where she should be. And it was like, you know, what? think of the other kids in the back of that car while this child was driving on a road in Houston in driver's ed. And the teacher didn't want to get sued or fired, so he just prayed really hard before he got behind the wheel with her. I mean, it's like any noise and she couldn't handle it. I mean, it's not her fault. But she's not supposed to be there. That's insane. And, of course, she couldn't pass the driver's test. I mean, you know, it's DMV wasn't that stupid. But I mean, school district, boy, lawyers will do whatever. I mean, it's it's the most dysfunctional system in the world. We need to fix the whole thing. Somebody over here. Okay. okay. I'm sorry. Good to both of y'all. No. I just wanted to know um, the tax testing in 2011 for ELAR will go away. I don't As a know. former, it is. It, it is. is. I don't yes, know. it is. It's going to be. What they're doing is they're going to... Um, into the course a lot of testing styles will oh, actually use SA and as a okay. former teacher, mm -hmm. Makes better sense. how do you think that will actually affect? I know what it's supposed to do, but as a former educator, well, what are your feelings about it? Well, I, my opinion is we need more than one kind of diploma. Okay. You don't, 
every university doesn't have every degree. There's no way you can be all things to all people. That's what the whole fun, fair, positive school. Everybody isn't the same. So if you have a kid that's terrible at math, she's a regular student, but she is awful at math, we could probably get her to where she can do enough math to survive in life, but she's never going to be able to pass word problems in algebra. Doesn't mean she can't hold a really good job and maybe she's awesome at interior design. We could still get her a diploma that says on there that she didn't pass the, the high math level test and she goes on to whatever career it is. Why does she not get a diploma? It's really stupid. So that's why we're having to change the testing system because these kids get to high school, you have one flaw, you can't get a diploma. Yet if you get in special ed, which I did, I used the system to get my, step, my youngest stepchild through the system. She has a diploma. I knew the system, I knew how to work it and all that kind of stuff. And she says now, she's 24 years old, she says, I don't know anything. I can't go to junior college. I, there's no way. I, she goes, I don't know anything. And I'm like, I know, but hey, we got the diploma. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's just really sad. But do I need to shut up? So I need no, to, it's, okay. Um, it's uh, 2.45 right now, um, but Colleen, if you're willing I'll to stay after and talk to anybody. Is that, and, um, we'll, we'll need to go ahead and clear it. So if you want to meet with folks okay. on the call, that's okay. fine. And, um, well, thank you all so much. should have to be substitute. I think that would be hysterical to make them substitute one week a year in a high school. That would do it. Middle school. They're calling it now. Oh, I only taught in Central Radio, so I can take a side there. It's very micromanaged. You know, we're all going to do the same thing.